They often say that the best leaders bring the smartest and brightest people around them and recognize them. Business of Architecture, episode 357. Today kicks off Women's History Month here in the U.S., and it just so happens that one of my favorite historical figures is a woman, Joan of Arc. Uh, just a little side note, little tangent. She has an incredible story. If you haven't read it, go check it out. Now, I don't have Joan of Arc as a guest today. That would be pretty remarkable. But I do have three impactful and accomplished women who are making history in their own right here with us today. Carrie Biles, Shen Fu, and Laura Ettelman compose the executive committee of Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill one of the world's most highly respected and successful architecture firms, otherwise known as SOM. SOM has completed some of the world's most legendary buildings, in addition to a plethora of work that spans everything from airports to university campuses. Notable buildings include the Willis Tower of Chicago, I prefer to use its former name, the Sears Tower, for personal reasons, and the Burj Khalifa, currently the world's tallest building. Now, before we jump into our interview today, here's a bit of background on today's guests. In addition to serving on the executive committee, Laura Edelman is the managing partner in SOM's New York office. She oversees the design and planning of a diverse range of projects across the globe, in addition to her management responsibilities. Her work ranges from large-scale master plans to interior design, and among the projects in her portfolio are some of the world's largest aviation and transportation hubs, new hospitals and research centers for healthcare and science, and campus master planning and design for both higher education and the civic and government sectors. Partner Carrie Biles is based in SOM's San Francisco office. She has a strong background in information technology and how it shapes the way we live in and design our buildings. Shen Fu is a managing partner with SOM's Chicago office. In 1994, Fu started her SOM career as a technical coordinator before assuming the position of a project manager in 2004. As an expert in the Asian market, she's worked on a wide range of international projects including master plans, commercial buildings, mixed-use developments, retail, hospitality, and convention and exhibition center projects. Today we discuss everything from inclusion, diversity, and equity to how to lead during challenging times. I'm sure you'll be uplifted and intrigued, moved, and inspired, as I have been, by the interviews with these three very accomplished women. So with that, here is today's show. Welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Nick. Yeah, good to have all three of you on here. Now, first, before we jump into the interview, just it's interesting how SOM has structured the top leadership. So just so people can get clear, can you tell us how you describe the group that you're a part of and what leadership role it has in the firm? And I guess I'll ask Carrie to answer that question. Well, sure. Um, SOM uh, has about 20 partners and 44 uh, directors worldwide. And um, in order to be nimble and address the issues that come our way, it's really hard to assemble such a large group every time an urgent decision needs to be made. So the partners elect uh, unanimously three partners to run the firm at any time, um, and that's the executive committee, and that's who you're speaking to uh, today. And one of the added benefits of actually having three partners versus um, a single individual is um, over time being a global practice, we realize that any one individual may perhaps overreact to local conditions or look at things from a singular perspective, uh, as earnest as they may be. But when you have three people working in different regions, different practices with different backgrounds, it means every time we jump on the phone to make an urgent decision, we've very carefully considered it. And um, it's a very well-balanced direction. And we found this to be a very successful model for our firm. Yeah, and I would add that we're fortunate that the three of us come from three different um, major offices and also um, communicate with our other offices. So we really try to gather um, feedback from all of our partners um, when we go into thinking about different things and making decisions. So it really gives us a way to, to channel our thinking together as a group, but also to bring um, perspectives from our other partners to, to our discussions. I'm curious, with, with so many offices and, and a staff that spans the globe, 
would you how how different are the offices from each other? I imagine there's some regional differences. Uh, is it like stepping into a completely different world, or is it like you you leave the you go to the Chicago office or the New York office, and it's like you stepped into your own office? I guess we'd all answer that a little differently, but I think there's definitely a lot of commonality, and we work very closely together to really think about you know the the work we do and the focus of the work we do and how we treat and handle things with our staff and and really work on things like mentorship and leadership. But then there are cultural differences, I think, in each region, you know, based on the people and um, just what that city is about and what that place is. So I think there's a lot of commonality, but there are um, there are differences. And that's natural because we're, we are really um, made of our people, you know, it's our groups of people and where they're living and how they're thinking that also influences us, I think. Yeah, I totally agree. We love the, the fact that the culture is different in each region. I would say that you can pretty much recognize an SOM building when you travel around the world because of the quality and certain principles that repeat. Uh, but the diversity of our our people and our locations um, is really something that we thrive on. And it makes it a joy to travel around the firm or as we do these days, zoom around the world. (laughs) I have a question for all three of you. And we'll start with Shen. This is for you. Okay. And the question is, as a leader of one of the world's premier design, architecture, engineering, and planning firms, for you, what is leadership? Leadership is actually you set up a very strong goal and you really try to work with everyone and listen to everyone first and developing the options and then later to coming up with consensus. But also it's very important during the whole process, you need to really set up a very big aspirational goal and also you need to really understand thinking out of boxes and to look at the boundary as an opportunity. Carrie, for you, same question. Yeah. Um, you know, I hate to do this, but I will borrow a phrase from Peter Drucker uh, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, you know, strategy is incredibly important. You, you need to step back from your day-to-day job and set out a long-term uh, goal and, and a bigger picture strategy for sure. But your strategy needs to constantly shift and change. So you can't just hang your hat on that. Um, Whereas when you think about culture, it's a set of of values and and its approach to our approach to respecting each other, listening to each other, creating um, a thriving environment for innovation. Uh, Culture is something that's sustainable. Culture is something that you can throw anything at it. And it will not only thrive, uh, but it'll grow stronger. And so I think a good example of that is this whole coronavirus uh, situation. Um, It wasn't part of our strategy for, you know, fiscal year 2020. Um, But when I look across the firm and Laura and Shen and I talk about this often, we're blown away by our people. They, They transition to work from home so easily and what's more important is um, how much they all cared for each other and, and all the concern that people have taken to check in with people, to continue to mentor people. Um, we've actually found in the Zoom format that we're closer together than we ever were uh, before. And, you know, continuing this biological analogy, so to speak, the most diverse organisms in biology are the ones that tend to survive. So the firm from the very beginning has always been very diverse. It was founded by two architects and an engineer, and we've been multidisciplined for uh, our whole existence at this point. And at some point in the late 80s, we realized we need to get back to our roots of a diverse uh, functional portfolio because we almost disappeared only focusing on class A, you know, high rise office buildings. What, What time period was that, Carrie? Oh, that was the late 80s. You know, we were doing largely class A um, high rise office buildings. And that's the first thing that disappears during a downturn. So we knew that functional diversity was something to get back to because it was part of our roots, um, but we'd moved away from it. And um, as you'll hear from everybody, uh, geographic diversity not only brings us new perspectives, but it, it allows us to um, 
you know, maintain our practice and keep our talent during economic downturns in different regions. And Laura will talk a little bit about this later, but we're really doubling down on um, following through on our commitment for, to the diversity of our employees. It's something that we talked about um, internally for a long time, and but finally realized that wanting something is not enough. So we actually um, created a TED committee, hired a new chief people officer, and Laura um, heads up that TED committee, and we'll talk about that, how we're really doubling down on diversity in that realm. But the whole goal here is for the best and brightest ideas, and that comes from these intersections between all these different perspectives. And um, the last thing I'd say about that, that culture is bringing all these people together is not enough. You have to create a safe place um, for them to speak out, to learn, to put ideas out, even if they don't, you know, if they're not sure that they're going to be the right idea. And, and that's very important. So I think this overall, you know, culture of innovation and diversity and trust is something that um, allowed us to be resilient during, you know, one of the most difficult um, times that we've experienced. Creating a culture is difficult. It's very, very hard. As a follow-up to that, your comment, what would you say, what are the maybe the top one or two keys in, in your estimation to creating a culture? Well, um, it would be interesting to hear what my colleagues think as well. But for me, I think it's leading by example and, um, you know, being honest and having integrity in, and a steadfast commitment to your principles has to be the foundation of everything that you do. And I think psychologists have pointed out that everything we do is either driven by love or fear. And when you start operating out of fear, that's when everything falls apart. And so in the, the scariest times, um, it's when I dig down and, and always try to base everything that we do out of love, no matter how challenging the conversation might be. So it's a pretty simple aspect, but I think you have to you have to start there. And then two additional items would be um, with that, you have to be willing to speak out and to call out behaviors that are not contributing to that culture. Um, and you have to be brave enough sometimes to move elements out of the way that are not uh, supporting that environment. Um, otherwise, it causes the destruction to the overall uh, the culture of place. So you have to be strong. Uh, I, you know, I talk about leading with love, but you have to be strong and you have to defend uh, the rest of the organization. That's very clear. Thank you. Laura, for you, what is leadership? I think there's multiple aspects to leadership, one of which is really um, learning to listen and listen to your clients as well as listen to your team members and consultants so that you can really bring together all of the ideas and thoughts and, and the needs and requirements. And so, you know, in many cases, being a leader is hearing all of those things and then being able to, as Shen said, putting forward um, aspirational goals for projects or, you know, in the case of creating culture, aspirational goals for ourselves as a group. You know, there's two aspects to our, our work. One is our people and how we work both with our clients and internally. And the other is the work that we ultimately design, plan and produce engineering and everything. So in many cases in projects, I think leadership is also um, founded on a foundation that um, we allow people to grow. You know, we, we bring, you know, they often say that the best leaders bring the smartest and brightest people around them and recognize them, giving people space and giving other people agency, having the strength maybe and confidence to say, we can empower all of those people to do, to do good things, enables you to be a leader more than a manager. You know, some people could use those terms synonymously, but in reality, you know, being a leader is taking all of the things that you hear, you observe. You know, one of the hard things about Zoom is you have to read the room in a very different way um, but I think that all of those things really go into um, leading projects. And if you think about it, one of S SOM's aspirations is also to lead our field, you know, to be a strong player in the architectural and engineering integrated practices across the world. 
you know, to, to help lead in the fight for climate change and for, for many of the other important things about research, materials, you know, all the things that are part of doing really good work. And so, you know, I think one of the other things we've been doing recently with, with all of the support of our partners is really expanding our thoughts about what, what aspects of different kinds of work and different kinds of thinking can go into being part of an architecture and engineering firm. You know, we are, we're thinking about AI. We think about a lot of things now. And so we're, we're finding ways to, I think, lead in the field and really think about all those things and how they come together to influence our culture, but to impact our projects and, and deliver the best. Got it. I hear you. So for you, it sounds like leadership is a multi-pronged approach, not only person to person, but there's, there's a, an organizations can lead, people can lead in innovation, you lead teams. You, you, yeah. you mentioned a distinction in, in uh, leadership versus management. Could you distill that for me? What For you, what's the difference between those two? Well, I think that, um, you know, my experience is that when you're just managing things, it's sort of the strategy of how to get it done, how to make a schedule, how to um, bring together the facts. But then leading is really how you take those and bring them, you know, it's like making the orchestra sing real, I don't know, orchestras play, not sing, but, um, you know, really bringing the music to the entire um, element of what your work is. And I think, um, you know, people often look at many managers are leaders um, uh, and many leaders manage things, but not all managers are leaders. And I think that, you know, you really have to think about the way you communicate um, in order to be a leader, because I think fundamentally people follow leaders. They may just listen to managers. I don't know. I, I'm not sure if that's enough clarity. <laughs> Uh, There's a powerful distinction. And Laura, I'd like to follow up and ask you, you mentioned listening as an important part of, of, of leadership. And then you also brought up communication right now, discussing management versus leadership. And so I, I, I'm curious, you know, someone who is a leader of a worldwide design firm, let's face it, you don't get there by, by not being a good listener, right? So we can safely say that all three of you are uh, great listeners, have your way of being able to do that. For someone that that maybe hasn't spent a lot of time doing that or maybe doesn't even understand that, what would you tell them? What does it take to truly listen? Because we hear that a lot, but what, is that, what does that mean for you? Um, to be open-minded and focus on what other people are saying to you. You know, don't immediately hear them and translate it to what you think, but really hearing them for what they're saying and really trying to um, maybe it's a little cliched to say, you know, try to walk in their shoes or, or be in what they're thinking, but to really put aside, you know, sometimes we even start and we're listening to a conversation and you immediately are bringing in your own ideas, but to sort of put them away, maybe make a note even and listen to what other people are saying so that you can really gather the essence of what's important to them in, in the case of a client, what, what their real goals are. Um, in many cases, our clients have many goals. Sometimes they even conflict. So sometimes we also not only have to listen to them, but help them distill what, what their thoughts are. So we really, you know, there's that whole sense of focus and a little bit of patience um, and, and even allowing some silence so that, that they can, feel like they have space to um, put out their thoughts. Yeah, Laura's got some some really good points. And I, I would just add to that, that another thing that I actually think my colleagues um, are very good at, uh, but it's something that we're constantly honing, is listening to what people aren't saying. Hmm. Um, you know, looking at the body language, Laura mentioned how hard it is these days over Zoom. But oftentimes you look in the meeting room and there's somebody that's over there squirming. They're not saying anything. Maybe they're kind of shy or maybe they're afraid their idea won't be received. You need to draw them out. And um, and sometimes people don't always say what they mean. And you can tell that by looking at their face, at their body language. And if you really, really want to get to the heart of the best ideas, you need to make sure everybody's contributing. 
I would love to hear, um, Shen, from you. So currently we're in the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, which has turned our world upside down, inside out, our personal lives inside out. Um, and we all fear, you know, at times we have fear and uncertainty and definitely COVID-19 has has compounded this. So I'd like to know for you, how do you deal with uncertainty, doubt, emotions of fear uh, that can paralyze us, that can paralyze team members and ultimately entire organizations? Hey, actually the pandemic has certainly been the biggest challenge we had in our career and in our life. And I was actually in China for a business trip in January, 2020. A week after I arrived, the government began issue the quarantine orders. In the middle of the night in Asia, I had to make a call to the executive committee. And we all immediately agreed that our staff safety is our number one priority. And we should move our staff in Asia to begin working from home. Outbreak of this virus came to the United States and Europe shortly after. And that's when we fully understand this will not be a short-term issue. This will be a long-term challenge. We, as a as one partnership, we created a crisis management committee composed of partners in each offices and our leaders in HR, technology, finance, and also communications. The first thing we did was to cancel all trips, travels, and shift the entire firm, more than 1,250 people, into a work from home setting. Then immediately we set up weekly town hall to keep everyone informed and connected globally. We also invited doctors to give our staff guidance on how to stay healthy and answer their questions and concerns. We provide a new additional benefit called One Medical, who can help us to collaborate on our return to the office protocols, provide lectures in staff safety, ease our access to the COVID-19 testing, symptom tracking, and hopefully in the future, vaccination. We also issued a few uh, survey to further understand everyone's need so that we could provide them with sufficient support for their well-being and their work. We also offered a stipend that everyone could use to purchase extra computers or economic uh, equipment working you know, with our Office of Technology, we ensured that everyone felt supported and had the proper equipment as we adopt to working from home. I think one of the most important things through this entire process was transparency. Just let everyone know their safe, safety comes first and they are part of our community and also we're all in this together. At the time we were so busy trying to find ways to keep our staff moving forward and make sure that the firm future was secured, that there was almost no time to sit down there and to worry and also being afraid. And to myself, actually my busy schedule has really kept me focused. Now, many years after, I recognize that one of the emotions I had felt is truly the gratitude for having such a great group of partners and staffs who have supported each other through this difficult time. In actually many ways, the the experience had brought us closer together, like, you know, Carrie had said a little earlier. And also there's a one positive things that came out of this that many families have had the chance to reconnect it over the period of this lockdown. And that they have been home when they ordinarily really not. Like my son and my daughter, they all came back from school. Looking forward to the future, 
actually once we overcome this pandemic, I think we all cannot wait to go back to our offices and work together again in person, especially because we actually had newly redesigned offices in our New York, Chicago, and San Francisco office. I think the vaccine are on the way and also the spring is coming. I love that. Uh, it's very hopeful and uh, hopefully not only a, a physical spring, but also a symbolic spring. It's amazing how quickly you mobilized and you summed that up very well. Shen, thank you so much for talking about the initiatives that SOM really took pretty quickly, very quickly, considering that you came directly back from China and it was like you were on it. And let, let's take this proactive. That, that's very commendable, especially for a large organization like yours to really pivot like that. So well done. I'm curious, uh, Carrie, both from you and from Laura, how about more on the personal side, dealing with the stress of, of work, dealing with fears and personal insecurities that we all have, right? And that sometimes when things like this happen, like COVID-19, they can flare up, or maybe you don't have them. But I'd like you to speak to that. Well, I think Shen was right. This uh, We were so concerned. I mean, to have uh, the safety of 1,250 people on your mind. And we did uh, go into work from home very quickly. In fact, we did a whole um, hour-long town hall educating um, our, our people about the virus and the protocols that we would be putting in place and had experts speak to them from technology to healthcare. And uh, in the San Francisco office, after doing that in the morning and after getting our people access to the physician to ask questions. By two o'clock that afternoon, we found out we had our first positive COVID test in the the San Francisco office. And by four o'clock, I was making an announcement to the San Francisco office, this is not a drill. Um, We are going into work from home. And um, it was great that we'd spent the morning educating people because everybody was incredibly calm and everybody went down to, you know, the office of technology and lined up to get their laptops and people gathered their, their documents and their papers. And we left the office on March 10th and we've never been back other than some dear and essential people that have been going in to do, um, you know, boot up servers and, and some critical essential tasks. So, So then we all went rolling into this work from home mode. And at first, um, you know, we just worked night and day. I I sat at the bar stool in my kitchen and soon, you know, I was in chronic pain. And it occurred to me that this really was more of a marathon than a sprint and that we all needed to pace ourselves. And so we started broadcasting that message to, to everyone. At first, you didn't. Can you imagine if we'd known how long this was going to go on at the time? I think it would have been too much information. It would have been overwhelming. Um, But just starting to broadcast that message that it's a marathon and not a sprint and people need to take take care of themselves um, was important. It was important to me, too. And unfortunately, I didn't listen to myself soon enough. Um, But by the fall, I was trying to make a break of, you know, doing stretching classes um, in front of the computer, just really trying to take care of um, my physical health. Because if you're not physically and emotionally healthy, then you can't be there for others. It's like that saying when you get on an airplane and they tell you that when the mask drops, please secure your, your own mask before trying to help others. And it's an important message to remember. But, um, you know, it's you really have to stop and make yourself do it because you're always going to be thinking about others first and um, and you could just really wear yourself out. So I think we've kind of paced. I think the firm is working very well right now and we're pacing ourselves and our teams are serving our clients so well, um, both in terms of delivering their, their building designs and documentation, um, but being there for the clients. Um, it's a relationship that we have. And as Shen points out, probably our saving grace is that we're all working madly away with our clients on their projects and we get lost in, in that mission. And that, that really helps a lot. Got it. Got it. Well said. Laura, from your side. Um, Yeah, I would echo what Carrie said, you know, it's been really important um, to be in touch with teams and, you know, Some people are saying at the end of the day, you know, I feel like I didn't talk to anyone. I feel like I talked to people all day, Um, which, you know, has a lot of um, virtue. Um, I think, you know, for me, it's also been really good. Um, We found one interesting thing amongst the partners, which is that, you know, we used to meet 
um, twice a year in person, all of us, you know, and that was like the traditional way. And we would get together for a number of days. And yes, it was nicer because we could have dinners together and breakfast. And although we were doing business meetings, but now because of the pandemic, it's interesting. We actually meet all together um, every Monday, um, you know, sometimes for half an hour, sometimes for an hour and a half. Um, and then, you know, we have subcommittees as well as the executive committee. But it's interesting. I think in a way we're talking to each other more, um, which I have found to be really good. Um, the other thing for me personally, which I think is something similar to what other people have done, is that, you know, I often work um, sort of late. I, I was doing that before the pandemic. Um, but I have just made myself go out and take a walk. Um, I uh, was looking to move closer to the city for many years now. Um, I live in the suburbs outside of New York. And I will say I've been lucky now to be in the suburbs because I can take a walk in the evening and just um, go out and um, spend 30 or 45 minutes just briskly walking and just sort of get your head together, finish the day, what's critical to do before the next day, and then take a little personal time um, for dinner and things. So I think that's been really good for me so that I can also just be there better for other people. You know, if you get to the point where, like Carrie said, if you get run down or if you aren't able to focus each day, you know, sleep well and get up, be refreshed, then how could you do what we were talking about earlier and really focus and listen for people? Um, so, so I think all those things, you know, keeping on a you know, a schedule. I used to travel a lot. So being home 100% is really strange almost. <laughs> I don't know. There's others of us, a couple of the partners who traveled a tremendous amount. We've all talked about that. Like, wow, I haven't gone anywhere practically in a year. So it's all very interesting. But uh, I think we're, I certainly am looking forward to getting back. Um, New York has a cohort um, of people going into the office. It's small, but I've only gone a few times so far because it's just so busy. You know, it's it's interesting that you mentioned going on walks and being able to enjoy that. I was just reading recently that some of the most prominent artists throughout history, that was a, a routine part of their schedule, was actually taking that time to let the mind whew, just kind of decompress and just kind of let that creativity come back in. Yeah. Laura, recently, SOM developed a 34-part action plan to strengthen and direct the firm's culture and practices, which puts a strong emphasis on equity and diversity. I'd like to know, for you, what is equity, what is diversity, and what is SOM doing to bring that about in the organization? So I'll start with the what is SOM doing and through that be able to answer you for me, what is equity and diversity? So the TED committee um, really began as one of our partner committees far before um, the unfortunate um, death of George Floyd. Um, it's the Talent, Equity, Diversity and Development Committee. And um, we created these partner committees almost two years ago at one of our meetings. We said, you know, we need to have some focus groups to work together. And so we really focused our um, 34 point initiative plan on two aspects, both of which we've talked about in our discussions a little earlier. One is about our internal culture and how we can bring greater equity and diversity into our actual cultures and our firm and the people we are and how we live. And the second is how can we bring equity to our work and really think about the work we do and how we can in addition to other goals and aspirations we have for things like climate change, really think about how our work can impact the equity of communities or how it can be more equitable. Because, you know, one thing that's really important in equity is access, access to, to buildings, access to good quality libraries, um, access to universities or to schools or for schools in perhaps uh, in every community to be equal, to be equal in the sense of providing things for people of all types. You know, and not everything is equal. In many cases, to provide equity, we need to do more for some than others, you know, because ultimately there's a balance. People have a different amount of either education, um, financial well-being, or other things. So providing equity is almost to provide the different support so that everyone can move forward 
in in an equal way in, in to really reach that equity. And that I think is one of the things that's most important to me. But the other thing that's really important about the 34 point plan is that we developed it not in a vacuum. You know, our committee did this along with many people in some of our, um, we call them ERGs, employee resource groups. And we talk to them, we, we engage with them, what is most important for you? And so, you know, I think that the plan ranges from things like bringing greater tra- personal training and, and training for people in the business of performing as architects, whether it be public speaking or um, ways to go help us to go get projects or all kinds of things to actually creating a universal sort of, we're calling it an ex- equity action committee that will bring together those, those uh, employee groups and, and a group who's going to focus on how we can bring equity to the workplace, to, to what we do in our workplace, the actual architecture and, and planning, particularly that we, we do. So I think it's been a really great thing where we have not only strengthened ourselves as a group, but um, put some rigor to a plan that we're now working with people across the firm with our employees to actually, you know, put them in sequence and actually put actions behind each of them. And so, you know, the important part of writing the plan was to put things down that we actually thought we could bring forward in action. Some are going to be, some have already been done in year one, and some will be in, in this coming year. And, and, and some we have, all of them, we have to continue as we go forward. Well, I definitely encourage all of our listeners to go to SOM's website. You can find that, uh, that action plan on the website. We'll link to that in the show notes, but it's definitely a great way to look at how a plan is, first of all, developed, how it's then broadcast, and then hopefully over time it's, it's implemented. And I know that this was an update to a former plan that you had made based upon the current situation in the world and, and the values that SOM represents. Yeah, no, we're really um, pleased and and I would say proud to see many, many um, of our staff and, and our, you know, our people really embracing helping to make these things happen. And um, that is also what is going to help us create greater diversity within the firm. You know, we have diversity, but we cannot stop pushing forward. We have to keep building on that momentum, both in the firm um, and in the profession overall, and particularly to help students, because we need more students of diverse backgrounds, diverse um, cultures, um, diverse ethnicities mm-hmm. to be interested in architecture and engineering and think that they can succeed and find a place and find a voice. And that's how it will be for SOM to be able to be a more diverse community. Amazing. We'll go into a quick lightning round, quote unquote, here. But the question I have for each of you is, uh, if you could have dinner with a dinner guest of any living person in the world today, who would it be and why? Well, it would absolutely be Bill Gates. Um, I am a profound admirer of his because of all the work he's doing now. Um, I have a tendency to err on the side of action versus perfection. You know, perfection doesn't exist. And if you wait for it to arrive, it will never, um, never appear. But if you move forward, you will constantly gain new knowledge and experience in order to refine an approach moving forward. And I've really admired the way he brings together experts from around the world to tackle some of the world's greatest challenges and actually comes up with viable plans because he's got a strong foundation in business. And I think that kind of leadership is really what our country needs more of, uh, profound ethics and morals um, paired with scientific facts and research and strong business acumen so that you can actually make something happen. So I would love to have a conversation with him. Wonderful. We'll go next to Laura, if that's okay. And then Shen, we'll, you'll, you'll bring it home for us. Sure. You know, with all the recent... Um, things around the election. I think I'd like to have dinner with Barack Obama because I think he would give perspective to his presidency, what a presidency really means. Like you ask us what it is to be a leader. Wow, that's a tough job. Um, And to have some perspective on what's gone on in the past few years, uh, four years since he left the presidency and what 
what could a president really do and what might we as people look forward to as we shift into the next um, period in the United States? We really need to be in a better place. Um, part of it was driven by the pandemic and part of it is just where we are today. And I think as um, people, you know, myself, I've done business overseas, I've done a lot of traveling, and I really feel like it's important to be able to say, I come from the United States and we're a strong and thoughtful nation. And I think we need to be thinking about that. And I think that um, that Barack Obama would have that kind of sort of both knowledge of the position and perspective having left left the role um, and looking forward to a new president. So that's my thought. That's a very difficult choice. But if I had to pick one at this time for now, it would be Andrea Bacelli, the Italian opera singer. I found his Music of Hope concert is very inspirational. It was during the hardest time when the pandemic has been spread all over Europe, China, and all over the world. And all humankind is facing a major challenge. In April of 2020, as an artist, he stood in front of an empty Milan Cathedral uh, Square, which is typically crowded with people from all over the world. And he used his music to start healing the wound of many families and put hope into everyone's heart. I don't really need to have a dinner with him, but it would be so great if I could attend one of his concerts mm -hmm. to celebrate the end of this pandemic. That's fantastic. Well, uh, I'm sure we'd all love tickets to that concert. That Absolutely. sounds excellent. Yeah, see yeah. you there. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, each of you, for your sharing your your thoughts, uh, your experience here with us on the Business of Architecture podcast. So this will go out to all of our listeners. Uh, they're really looking forward to getting, uh, you know, a bit of an inside peek of what SOM is all about. We know that in the industry, it has a very strong name, very strong reputation. Like you, you probably studied those buildings and, and uh, architects when you were in school. So it's very fun. And it's it's been wonderful to have each of you on here. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Shen Fu, thank you for being on the Business of Architecture. Laura Edelman, thank you for being here. And Carrie Biles, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Enoch. Thank, thank you, Enoch. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem. <laughs>